Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way, I want to jump over the pack and here he comes! Oh, Ryan! This is Buddy Franklin! This is the greatest showman! Got the handball off to Myers, Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Randall Dazzle Rioli. Oh, who else? McDonald! Tim From inside the centre square, boys kick the goal! time of day everyone welcome to the round 21 preview here on americans watching the footy this is our 124th episode our 52nd episode of season two as if anybody other than myself benjamin castle and my brother ethan are keeping track i from south san francisco california i from alpharetta georgia just outside of atlanta this should be barring any unexpected twists the final road show of the season Yeah, really, now that it's August, it's high school football time for you, probably. Yeah, shame that those Friday nights coincide with the pointy end of the footy season, including finals. That's just about the only place it usually intersects, although I guess there might be some overlap with round 24. I'm not sure. I haven't even thought that far. I did notice that some schools started today, like August 1st is the first day of school. What the fuck? Well, I know that that's the case in some parts of the U.S. where summers are particularly hot. I know they go back to school very early in Arizona. I think some Arizona schools might have actually even started in late July. Meanwhile, some schools around us start as early as next week. Some places of the country still don't start until the day after Labor Day, so the Tuesday after the first Monday of September. I know that's the case in Maryland, where our dad is from, because... So many high school age kids go work on the Eastern Shore in the summer. I think any school starting before like mid-August is insane. Mid-August, I can live. Before that, no, that's that's not okay. Well, we're both out of school. Well, I'm out of school for now. I may be back in uh, school next year going for a teaching credential. But that's beside the point. You know, if you go to school, you're a fucking nerd. All right, I'll embrace being a nerd then. But yeah, the point is footy. Just eight points separate fifth from the top and fifth from the bottom with four rounds to play. That hasn't been the case since 2007. I don't think this season's ending as happily as that one did. Yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, I would have been very happy back then still just kind of riding a premiership high myself. But round 21 starts with two clubs who have one flag since those days. That being the Dogs and the Tigers at Marvel Stadium. Is this Richmond's first time playing at Marvel since Dimmer's departure, or am I missing something, Ethan? I think it is. Let me check. So his final game was Dreamtime, right? Yeah, which was uh, round 10, I think. Well, let's see here. Since then, they have played MCG, GWS away, Frio away, G, Gamma, G, Optus, G, G. So... Yeah, they will be at Marvel the next couple weeks, so they don't have a dreaded Marvel home game. That was against the Suns earlier this year, and they got shit on. Yeah, it was it was dreaded all right. I know in the earliest days at Marvel, the Cats would have a couple home games there instead of the, you know playing a couple at the G, which I wouldn't complain about. We've actually done quite well there. Anyway, the first time these teams played was all the way back in round four, a game the Bulldogs won by five despite Richmond going on a massive run in the second quarter. Yeah, they scored seven of their 11 goals within 15 minutes of clock time in that second quarter. It was a somewhat wet game, especially in the second half, but the Bulldogs did enough from clearance to dictate most of the game. And even with some injuries to their back line, with Alex Keith and Hayden Crozier getting hurt, they held their own when they needed to down the stretch. That was the Easter round. I believe I took a nap at one point during this game and woke up and was just like very confused. I'm not sure if I woke you up then, but I'm pretty sure that did happen. The Bulldogs enter this game at 10-9 and nine in 8th after falling to the Giants in Ballarat. The Tigers 9-9-1 nine, nine and one in 11th after falling to the Ds at the G. As this is Friday Night Footy, it'll be at 7.50pm local time. 
5.50 a.m. Eastern, 2.50 a.m. Pacific for American audiences on Fox Sports 2. The Bulldogs losing last week makes this game way more spicy. Not as spicy as the Ethiopian food I had today, which was like easily the spiciest Ethiopian food I've ever had. Like, I was sweating. But there still shouldn't be a ton of pressure on the dogs considering they have the Hawks and Eagles the next two weeks. Not that the Hawks in Tasmania are particularly forgiving, or the Hawks anywhere for that matter, because clearly Hawthorne's a cut above the very bottom. But I think most people are taking the Bulldogs in finals as a grant still, which I largely am. I don't see too many scenarios where they miss out. At this point, I don't either, though their back line will definitely need some shuffling with Alex Keith getting concussed and Josh Bruce rupturing his right ACL. He ruptured the left in 2021, so we talk about how devastating that is from a personal career standpoint for him that, you know, this very well could be the end for Josh Bruce at age 31, and we still question why he ended up being moved to the back. We've said this on numerous episodes, but I'm going to mention it one more time. First off, moving the guy who was kicking 10 goals not long ago from forward to defender seems silly. Second, doing it after he's had an injury that's going to limit his mobility seems even dumb. And what a surprise, it has really worked. And I guess he can probably close the book on it now, sadly. I hope he comes back and plays forward again where he belongs. I know that's probably not the most likely scenario. The odds of him getting another game at some point are quite slim, but that's that's what I'm hope, holding out hope for. But for now, it's going to be tough missing not just him, but Alex Keith, who had actually been playing pretty well as of late. On the other hand, looks like Liam Jones should be back from his broken arm, and Ed Richards, who was out sick last round, should be back. I would say Richards is close to a guaranteed in, whereas I would put Jones on the kind of probable side of things. Richards was sorely missed last week with Taylor DeRay having to take that Toby Green matchup and Toby absolutely killing him and the rest of the Bulldogs backs in the third quarter. That was after Keith had gone out as well because he got concussed in the second quarter. And listening to First Crack today, the guys were wondering again why Eric Naughton, who had been losing the matchup with Sam Taylor, wasn't moved to center half back to try to stem the bleeding there, take on Toby a bit more because Rory Lobb isn't that same defensive solution at all. You've got so many talls there in the lineup for the Bulldogs, and they're clearly still figuring out how to use them, which is not a great recipe when you also have a coach who hardly ever makes in-game adjustments. Also, if you're still trying to figure out some of these things in round 21, that's not great, especially if it's something that you've been trying to deal with all year. It's not like this is a new problem. On the Richmond side of things, nobody got hurt in round 20, but Josh Gibkiss has been officially ruled out for the season, so he does not get a game all year, which sucks because I I think we both really liked him last year, especially his versatility and the way he was used. Yeah, he got 18 games in his debut year, pick nine in 2021, and you can tell how much his absence has affected them, even with Noah Balta playing well as of late. Those first couple months where Balta wasn't as strong, He's a presence they really could have used back there. And even still, you know, he would he would supplement them decently well. The defensive mix hasn't been as steady for the Tigers really at all this season. You had individual performers going very well in there. And Nick Flostow probably playing his way into the All-Australian 40. Nathan Broad still being capable one-on-one. Balta better as of late. Dylan Grimes still Dylan Grimes. But Gibkiss would have helped complete things. You mentioned Balta. Um, I don't know if how much of that game against the D's from this past round you watched, but you noticed at one point they just gave up on him handling Harrison Petty because it was not working for him. No, he ended up swinging forward and kicked a pretty nice goal. So the versatility can still be found on this Richmond list. It's just if you also add Gibkiss, you'd have even more. But on the topic of returns now, uh, a couple big ones this week. Well, one very big in terms of stature with Toby Dan Curtis coming back from his three game suspension. It would have been four. If Tom right. Stewart get four last year, that that's the standard that needs to be set. It seems like suspension standards year over year aren't upheld nearly as much as we expect them to be. No, not at all. And then the other big return, Jaded Short, who has been playing more into Richmond's attack and kicking for some longer goals himself in the weeks prior to his hamstring injury. He looks to be ready as well. Now, Andrew McWalter has said that Nan Curtis and Yvonne Soldo could be in together. 
So does that maybe force Ben Miller out of things, or do you keep him as a tall back? Miller was subbed out this past week, but against the Bulldogs' talls, it's an interesting scenario. How do you see that, Ethan? Well, who comes out if Miller does? I think Solov's got to be in. He played so well. And was able to body up and beat at times Max Gone in the first half before Gone remembered, wait, I'm Max Gone. I, I guess if you want to stick with Miller this week against the Talls, you could take Ryan Mansell out, even though I think most weeks I'd rather have Mansell. And I'd say you might have to contort your lineup to face the opposition in this case. Mansell was a big tackler against the D's, put on a couple bone crunching ones, but he seems like he would be the first guy out. And it would be difficult for anybody else to really come in. And then does Matthew Coltard stay as the sub? I mean, he had that instant goal for his first in the AFL, but otherwise was pretty quiet. I think he only had two other touches. So there's some flexibility there. Maybe Mansell could be a type that you bring on late to help with some of the run and pressure. Yeah, or that's one where, you know, if someone gets hurt earlier, you know, mind bringing him in. Either him or Miller, you could do that. I think Mansell would probably make more sense, is probably better fit for the sub role. I just think a tall sub is awkward for so many reasons. It requires a very specific matchup for it to work. And I feel like you need all your talls in from the get-go against this dogs group. Bulldogs favored by eight and a half. I think that's a little high. I have no idea how the, uh, how to tip this game at all because the Tigers are the least predictable or typical team in the competition. Which makes for good entertainment, just makes for harder tipping. And even with the midfield group they have, it's going to be tough to match up with top-end depth that the Bulldogs have at clearance unless you have Dustin Martin on ball a bit more, taking some more center bounces rather than starting him more in the forward 50. That's an adjustment I could see. To kick off Saturday, we've got a matchup that's been pretty fun at times, especially when it's out west, but this one is at Marvel. Marvel gets a lot of run this round. We get three games there as opposed to just one at the G as Essendon host West Coast in the early Saturday slot. So 1.45 p.m. locally, 11.45 a.m. in Perth, Friday night in the U.S., 11.45 p.m. Eastern, and 8.45 p.m. Pacific. For U.S. TV audiences that are not on Watch AFL, well, there's a good chance you won't have much interest in watching this game. But if you do, it'll be shown on delay at 5.30 a.m. Pacific, 8.30 a.m. Eastern, on Fox Soccer Plus. Essendon have dropped down to 13th with their recent skid, but they do have this matchup against the Eagles and then North this coming week, so their destiny is very much still in their hands with four rounds to play. The Eagles, um, they're still in 18th. But they won a game. Uh, yeah, they did. And off the back of that, Bung has announced he's retiring. Go out on top. He's going to play in the final two home games, so... There's a likelihood that, sadly, Shannon Hearn will be rested this round. I mean, if Jeremy McGovern comes back in, that'll be a bit easier to stomach. But Peter Wright could have some real fun. I think it would require Elliot Yo to have that steadier defensive 50 role again, which we saw when he came on for Rhett Bazo in the second quarter. He's ready to go for a full game. I doubt he's the sub again. I was wondering about that since it was such an early tactical sub. First off, I hope it was communicated in advance. Like we saw a few weeks ago when Ben King got subbed out, you know, you could see him being told like, hey, you need to get it. And he didn't get gifts together. I hope that Bazo wasn't like blindsided by it. I doubt that he was. Anyway, okay. does Bazo get in the lineup this week? I doubt it. Between McGovern, maybe Josh Rotham, or if it's just a straight swap of yo, I think Bazo is going to be devoted this week. That would make sense. But just thinking about Shannon Hurd, obviously because we... Came to the game in 2020. We didn't see his prime, but such a well-liked player, clearly, and an out-of-state player, a South Australian product who has put his heart and soul into the West Coast Eagles, their premiership captain. I hope he's able to go out like he came in and score a goal with his last kick. He scored a goal with his first kick at Subiaco in 06. I think it was for around 60 meters. On the Essendon side, looks like they will still be missing... Sam Draper, Dylan Scheel, and Jake Stringer. Last week, Alvin Davy Jr. was a late in, but got subbed out for Will Snelling. Yeah, they basically made a swap there where initially Alwood was the sub, and then they decided, nah, we'll have him in first, and then Snelling can come on. And Snelling actually had more touches than Davy did after being 
subbed on. So I think Snelling does make his way into the 22 again this week. I'd like to see Davey get some more run in the reserves, and he'll tell you when he's ready. Other than that, maybe you bring Sam Liedemann back in as a defender. He's done well in the reserves in that regard. So it's Kate Baldwin. And then Elijah Sada's gets his debut this week. I think this would be a great game to do it. A newly surefire win, a game where it's a good time to for Brad Scott and company to do some experimentation. Yes to Sadas and yes to Wiedemann in defense. But will they say yes to the dress? I don't know, Randy. Bombers favored by 50 and a half. You got your Eagles prediction wrong last week. Uh, try to make a better one. Uh, look, I a lot of it depends on what defenders are in. If McGovern's in, and if I count on him to not do his hamstring, and then I, I could see this being in the 50 to 60 range. I love how competitive the Eagles were in the midfield this past week. I hope they're able to keep on that pressure. It's just that somebody's going to really need to body up to Zach Barrett and maybe Darcy Parrish as well. And I'm not sure if there's one player that's really able to run with them. The thing that I'd like this Eagles group to figure out in the midfield within the next year or so is who could be a top-level tagger. Here's the thing that I would like to see them continue from this past week. Tackles inside 50. That's phenomenal in that regard this past week. Usually something they've gotten absolutely crushed on, so it was nice to see them flip that around. If if you get blown out but have a good day tech with the margin for tackles inside 50, you can see that as, all right, you know, we built something here. We made steps forward. You just want to see that, you know, some like consistent week-to-week performances and growth in that area across multiple games would be a great example. And any team can pressure. You can do it against any opponent. This is not something that should just be there against bottom-level competition like North. One more interesting thing about this matchup before we move on. The last seven head-to-head meetings between the Eagles and Bombers were all West Coast home games, including a 2020 meeting that was played at the GABA. This is their first meeting in Victoria since round nine of 2017. Another weird thing with the Eagles' schedule. Maybe it's partially because of how strong Essendon's following is in the West, but that shouldn't be the explanation on its own. They're, it, it just needs to be so much more even. 25 minutes after the bounce at Marvel, you got a bounce at the Adelaide Oval. 40 p.m. local time in Adelaide. The Crows host the Gold Coast Suns. The Mighty Sun. Both clubs at 9 and 10, and both coming off surprising wins in rivalries this past week. For Eastern Australian viewers, it'll be a 2.10 p.m. bounce. For Americans, 12.10 p.m. Eastern Saturday, 9.10 p.m. Pacific Friday. This is your Fox Sports 2 game out of the window. And uh, because it's not the Eagles, I approve. Also because these teams had an interesting matchup in the top end in round 12. That was your game, I recall. Yeah, the Cats were playing the Bulldogs at the same time, so I did not watch this one very closely. I remember going back and watching it get her tape. A 25-point Suns win where after Gold Coast surrendered the lead early in the fourth, they came home with five of the last six. They were also down like 30-some in the second quarter, weren't they? That sounds right because the Crows had kicked six goals to two in the first, and I think they got the first goal of the second quarter as well. Did Riley O'Brien hit a couple in that game? O'Brien had one, but it was Jack Vindalukosius who kicked five goals one. And really, it was him and... Matt Rowell, who were the story for the Suns, because Rowell was unstoppable in contests. Ben Keyes was playing more than Noah Anderson, I believe, at the start of that. Keyes ended up really being forced to go to Rowell, and Matt Rowell still bulldozed through him. By this point in the season, the grass thing had been well-established, right? I just backdated it based off of Mason Cox show stuff. It was about a month earlier. Okay, but, oh, he had an interview, uh at the Darwin game against the Dogs about grass. That was what it was. Got it. Got it, okay. Ryan, don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. Yeah. No. Whimper. Parables. Has you done the hand thing lately? What hand thing? Have you done the hand? Oh, that. Yes, yes. Among many things. Okay, let's, uh, should we pick things up? Yes. Parables. Bailey Humphrey also feasted in that game. He had a fun time in Darwin in general. You don't want to bring the Suns in Darwin. And you don't want to play the Crows in Adelaide, which is why I think the Crows will handle this. Although, defensively, Jordan Butts has now been confirmed to be out for the rest of the season. 
So that's no Butts, no Dude, no Murray. As I said, I think Murray's the most important of those. We're going to get a debut this week in former Port Adelaide Premiership captain Daryl Borlase's son, James Borlase, who was not born in South Australia. He was born in Egypt. Yeah, which means that the number of Egyptian board players in the AFL will go up to two. Mac Andrew, probably a bit of a different situation. I don't think James Borlase was in a refugee camp, as I'm pretty sure Mac Andrew was. But yeah, that's why Borlase is an academy product of the Crows, rather than being a father's son pick for Port. Okay, Andrew so might not have been a refugee camp, but if you're South Sudanese, you probably were born to refugees if you were born outside of South Sudan. At that point in time, yes. Just thinking about this, you know, this new look Crow's back group with, more or less with a really big frame, and Mark Keen being on a bit of the skinnier end, but able to take on a tall target like Charlie Dixon very well in Showdown 54 last week. I was thrilled for Keen. I thought they were going to get eaten alive. I'm really impressed. You know, that they scored big is much less surprising than them being able to hold Port to... Well, what did Port finish with? It wasn't huge. Something in the 70s or 80s? Lower. 65. They kicked 9-11. 9-11. Nine. Nine. <laughs> Did also note that Josh Rochelle is available after serving his two-game suspension for striking Harry Perryman. It's going to be tough for many changes to be made aside from Rochelle coming in, though, so even with... Which even come in for... It better not be Matt Crouch. No. The second in showdown medal voting, their most consistent midfielder last week. I remember there was some speculation that maybe, you know, internally they disciplined Rochelle and he's out for a couple more games beyond the league issued suspension. We'll we'll know when lists come out. Yeah, I mean, thinking about who he'd come in for, I would hate to say one of Jake Saliga or Harry Schomburg. I've liked that Schomburg's played lately. I have as well. It's it's Saligo who's been dropped a bit more. I'm wondering if if that's the solution there. It's a it's a tough spot for the Crows coaching staff. Yeah, Saligo would would be a more logical one, I guess. Down at the Sandville, Sam Barry, 29 disposals and nine clearances instead of obscene tackling numbers, and then Brayton Cook played forward, kicked three. Yeah, Cook usually uh more of a winger. We're seeing decent depth on this. Crows list, which is nice to know, especially when, you know, it doesn't look like this is going to be the year for them, but they're still rowing this young group pretty nicely. The Suns came away from Q Clash 25 with a surprise win and no injuries, and given how they played, it would be difficult for them to change much, despite Rain Fiorini and Ben Long, among others, doing well in their reserves Q Clash win. Look, if you're holding the Lions in the 50s, you're not changing your defense. Fiorini, maybe you pop him back into a sub roll or something. Crows favored by 18 and a half. Home field advantage. The Gold Coast Suns have yet to win at the Adelaide Oval. That said, this could still be a really hard game to predict. I, I just, I still like the chances. I feel pretty strongly that the Crows are going to win this game. It's a matter of how. Uh, the pressure going both ways should be outstanding given that was a strength of both these sides this past week. And it's something that they would clearly have to keep up. 93% have tipped the Crows. Yikes. I think that's, that's fair. I think, just like I said, the margin is the more interesting aspect and how we get there. How did I get here? The end. Your midday Saturday game is Hawthorne hosting Collingwood at the MCG. Typical 4.35 p.m. local time, 2.35 a.m. on the East Coast of the United States, so it'll still be Friday on the West Coast, 11.35 p.m. This is a Fox Soccer Plus game. The Hawks put up a damn good fight this past week against the Saints, even though they were clobbered in the first quarter. They adjusted, took to the wing opposite Jack Sinclair really well, and they worked it back to an 11-point margin at one point. The Hawks owner at 5-14 and 14 in 16. The Pies... An uncharacteristic defeat to uh, Carlton this past week for so many reasons. They still hold in first at 16-3, and three, but a lot of their contest numbers have slipped away as of late. It's been something that's gradual, but a concern. Yeah, I was looking at uh, these numbers or listening to them, really. Uh, David King talking about it this past week. Love listening to First Crack. Kingy's game analysis 
is great. Just don't ask him about a fucking ladder. I need the ladder to Andrew Gaze. Absolutely. But since round 10, Collingwood have dropped from top in ground ball differential to the very bottom, from number four to number 13 in time of the forward half, and number five to number 15 in clearance differential. These seems like things that they should be able to solve given the strengths they have on their list, but Hawthorne could make them sweat even for more than a half in this game with their contest ability. Flipping in something like that is why I think losing last week was probably the best thing that happened to Collingwood. I think it's kind of the wake-up call that they needed. I, I don't like the idea of a necessary loss. It's a loss that they were able to afford, I'll say that. I think the question for this game, I don't think anyone doubts that Collingwood are going to win it. Not that Hawthorne are a bad team. We've been over this many times. But simply put, Collingwood's better. Don't be shocked if the Hawks hang around, but this is this is going to be a Collingwood win barring some really, really ridiculous shit. Hawthorne had major defensive issues against the Saints. They came out of round 20 injury-free, but there are certainly some guys who could be omitted after that game. Uh, Ed Reeves will be back from his suspension. I'd like to see him. We, we'd both like to see him as tall forward, kind of secondary rock. In all likelihood, Lloyd Meek just goes out. I don't know. I don't think so. I think there's certainly room for both. Other than that, Carl Aim on his test, the injury that held him out last week. Correct. And he's been one of their biggest ground gainers this year. A long kick, every one of the oval, and generally pretty accurate. We saw it at Port, but it's more noticeable now because he's not playing in the same group as Dan Houston and Kane Farrell. With the sub last week, Hawthorne went taller. They took out Seamus Mitchell to bring in James Blank. Maybe they go taller from the start. See, that's an area, where, that's a situation where a tall sub works. Yeah, there it goes. But there are plenty of candidates there. I'm thinking two in particular. In the back, it could be Jack, that's good, Scrimshaw, who was a leader for Box Hill this past week. And up front, Denver Granger Barast has emerged as a key forward option and kicked five goals this past week. He also got subbed out a couple weeks ago with zero touches. So I, I don't know what bringing him back would do. I think that's just shuffling around deck chairs right now. I don't think he has another Tony Snell game. I don't know if he has a good game, but probably not as bad. Looks like Ned Long played well. Everson Jacko was good at forward, and Fergus Green came back in. So a lot of options there. It's not like Hawthorne are ever short of guys who are capable of playing at the AFL level. They usually have probably close to 30 available to be selected. It's just a matter of which ones actually play up to that level that week. Now, more unfortunate news, Max Lynch, or Maximum Lunch as he's known on Instagram, has retired. An independent medical panel recommended he no longer participate in contact sports. He's had a lot of concussion issues. I was never of the belief that he was a particularly skilled player, but he seemed like one of the most entertaining people in a sport full of entertaining people, and it sucks that he's not going to play anymore. I really hope he has a coaching or media career. Selfishly, I really hope it's a media career because... I think he's really funny, and if we could have him talking more, that's always a good thing. So, Well, his coaching career has already started because he's working as a development coach for Hawthorne's AFLW side, so that's a plus already. That was known about beforehand, but I guess that uh, that's being accelerated now. The Pies came out of round 20 injury-free as well, but Mason Cox was quiet again, and he was subbed out, so there are some options there for replacement. Because you got Dan McStay in there as well, commanding a lot of the tall attention along with Darcy Cameron, maybe go a little bit smaller. You bring in Ash Johnson off of a four goals, four performance in the BFL. You had Nathan Kruger and Will Kelly kicking three goals each as well. Or maybe you just decide, now let's fuck things up and bring Jack Ginnivan back. I think he probably should have been in this past week without Bobby Hill available. Sounds like Bobby will return this week from his illness, but... That was a pretty glaring omission, honestly, to not have that smaller forward spark. I hope Mason stays in, selfishly. I'd love for him to prove David King wrong after David King called him Seinfeld, a big show about nothing, which is a great insult, like props for creativity. And I think it would be tough, you know, you get dropped like a week after you sign an extension, plus he's very clearly one of Craig McRae's people. So I, I, I'm hoping he's kind of told, like, Give us something this week or you're going to get dropped, but I'm not certain how they go with that. The big news out of the Pies camp this week, though, is 
contract extensions for the day cost brothers nick five years through 2029 josh six years through 2030 we knew these were going to happen now they have you can stop talking about it i guess i mean i don't know if we have the financial terms but there there was talk about nick getting what's considered a lot of money in the afl world which is not a lot of money in almost any other sporting world i am so irritated with the fact that there's pretty much no transparency on contracts we get those those little bracket type things the year after but i wonder why it is that there's no transparency about it uh, is there something in the cba about it i find it very confusing i think it'll be fun because you know we'd be able to look at like try to do the math you know how can they stay under the cap and they keep these guys around i i like stuff like that and it would also show people no Geelong are within the rules and i think it would be fun because there are enough extremely intelligent stat people in the AFL sphere that could probably do some fun like data visualizations and stuff and fi- and you know figure out like which guys are badly overpaid or underpaid. Realistically they're all underpaid, but being relative. That's one of the things I love when it comes to uh ice hockey analysis with uh the whole NHL Twitter sphere. And Cap Friendly is a brilliant site for all the stuff like that, trying to figure out contracts. So yeah, there there needs to be something else in there. Pies favored by 32 and a half. I'd probably push this one out a little bit more, maybe to like 38 or so. No more than that. It's difficult to tip a margin in a lot of these games. It's easy to tip a winner. That's the case all along. I mean, did we expect last year to be such a close meeting? Back in round 12 last year, Ollie Henry had the game winning goal for the Pies, and that's a name that they love to hate now. That was the third of Collingwood's 11 straight wins as they came home by four. And this is a matchup that's pretty much always at the G. This will be their 34th meeting since 2001, and 31 of them will be at the home of footy. I'm surprised that there were a couple non-COVID reasons that games were ever played elsewhere. You know, Benjamin, 78% of our listeners are between 18 and 35 years old, so they probably want to start a podcast like we did. How did you know that number, Ethan? Thanks to the analytics we have for Spotify for Podcasters. Formerly known as Anchor, sorry for you fans, Spotify for Podcasters has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. No fancy software needed. It's so easy you can edit it while drunk. And Spotify for Podcasters doesn't just allow you to upload to Spotify. You can also distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Stitcher, and more just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free... You can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Hint, hint. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to podcasters.spotify.com to get started today. Don't forget, we're on Twitter collectively at Americans Footy. Personally, I'm on Twitter at Castle Media. That's Castle with the K. Benjamin's on Twitter, but who cares about him? Ryan's the important one here. Ryan Harambe Castle, our footy cat. He is on Instagram at cat named Brian. Some serious entertainment late Saturday. The FS2 game for the late window is Geelong and Port Adelaide at the Cattery, which is 5.25 a.m. Eastern, 2.25 a.m. Pacific for Americans. For South Australian audiences, it's a 6.55 p.m. bounce for everyone on the Pacific coast of Australia, 7.25 p.m. I imagine this will be as, well, every ticket at the Cattery is even harder to get this year with the construction going on, but Considering what this game means for both of these teams, particularly Geelong trying to bounce back from that Dockers defeat, it's desperate stuff. It's pretty much win or you're not going to be playing in September. And it's not going to be easy considering some of the injuries. Cats under at 9 9 and 1, sitting in ninth with a difficult remaining schedule. The Power at 14 and 5, they are in second. These teams met just seven weeks ago on a Thursday at the Adelaide Oval where the Power won by 38. That was just a game where you couldn't be mad at that, Ethan, with the Nats just getting outplayed. Just getting beat, especially in the third quarter. That was really... What was frustrating was there were opportunities there, and then all of a sudden it was just... Like, basically, it happened overnight. Like, almost instantly. Willem Drew was big in that third quarter with his pressure. Todd Marshall had three goals. Jeremy Finlayson had four. And Quinton Narkel making his power debut scored too. Those aforementioned injuries from the Cats 
Mark Blitzov's hamstring, which is considered medium term, but broadcasters seem to perceive that it was a pretty significant one at the time. But knowing him, that's a guy that I trust to get back sooner than the average person because he's not exactly an ordinary athlete. And then Tom Hawkins considered a short term one. Maybe he's back week against Collingwood. I'm much more concerned about the Blitzov's absence than Hawkins. There are enough other good forwards, but this team does not have a lot of good midfielders. Please bring Mitch Nevitt back in. It is that simple. Or Ollie Dempsey. That could work. So how about VFL, both? VFL numbers are going to be inflated because you were playing against the Bull Ants. But Brandon Parfit had a goal off 40 disposals. I still, I mean, I know if he's probably the best guy for ground ball contests, but he's looked so bad at the ASL level this year. It's tough. Uh, Dempsey, five goals, three behinds off 29 disposals, 13 marks. Shannon Neal, 3-4, 21 disposals, 11 marks. So maybe one of them comes in at forward. Sam Metagola put up 28 disposals. You could do something with his speed. Maybe you put him on a wing and play Max Holmes towards the middle. And then both Nevin and Asaba Radagalea got good reviews. So there are options there. And I love that nobody's mentioned John Seglar. Well, Seglar's still, I think, working his way back from an injury of sorts. So, I mean, at this point, do you think Radagalea is going to have some rocket defending time? Do you throw Sam DeConing in there more? Here's something interesting, though. Gary Rowan actually did a decent job as, like, poor man's Mark Blitzovs last week, and I wouldn't mind him getting a few of those forward rock contests, as crazy as that sounds. There, there are options here. I said before, though, if you're really looking to salvage this year, I think you bring Nevin in. If you're really looking towards the road ahead, you probably lean towards Dempsey. It's just, if Parfit comes in, he better have a good game, because he's looked so bad at this level this year, which is really surprising to me, because I really liked him. Also, Jed Butte should be fully available. Don't know how you plan on deploying everyone defensively. I guess without blitz ups, you can flex some guys around and make things work in there so you can have Ola Jashny in. That's the other reason why I'm thinking Dakota will get some more ruck time. One other sort of injury news this week. Jeremy Cameron got headbutted in a pub the other night, unprovoked apparently. I mean, I wasn't happy with his goal kicking performance, but that it seems like a little bit of an overreaction. Wrong code of football for headbutting people. But yeah, Cameron's fine. He'll be able to play. Okay, Mark Fisher, is that you? No, I'm going off of what's been recorded. I bet Mark Fisher still w- would send him out there under seven minutes afterward. So as we mentioned on the recap, Alira Lear and Lockie Jones were placed in concussion protocols on Monday. It's not that they failed the SCAT 5 assessments, you know, the concussion tests. It's because they presented symptoms and out of, you know, one of our least favorite terms, and it should be one of everybody's least favorite terms out of an abundance of caution. Can you not just say we fucked up? They keep digging themselves deeper the way they've handled this whole thing. And again, this isn't the first time. You had an instant last year as well with a head clash between Tom Jonas and Zach Butters. How do you not see that immediately? You saw Alir wasn't in control of himself, clenched his fist on the way down, that's a clear sign. No, you, you've been out. Thinking about how this affects the game plan, Geelong could definitely punish the Port back line being without probably their best and most consistent defender, even though he got clowned by Taylor Walker this past week, both before and after the concussion. Tom Jonas is someone who could potentially replace Alir and Riley Bonner and Jay's bear going to be considered for Lockheed Jones, but I've got a feeling that forwards both tall and small have a chance to feast this week for the Cats. If Tom Hawkins was in, I would feel pretty good about that. This feels like a time where Jeremy Cameron should be able to bounce back. Maybe it's a big game for one of the smaller forwards instead. Maybe it's a Tyson Stengel week. I don't know. My concern, despite the fact that this team has averaged less than 60 points the last two rounds, is much more in the midfield where it's been pretty much all year. Cameron and Stengel cooked against the power last year, so... There's hope there. The Cameron kick from the boundary is still like one of my favorite moments of last season. The the barrel at the end of the third quarter of the home game against Port. That was so fun. Other things to watch for Port. Really, Rioli is available to return after his suspension. Scott Lysette is a test to return from a knee injury. And then you got to expect that Travis Boak will be back into the 22. He was the sub last week. The Cats are favored by 10 and a half. 
which I'm tipping poor, easy. Oh, I am too. Well, you you do that out of superstition, but also again, I genuinely think it's hard to bet on this team with how they played lately. One thing that I noticed last week as to why Patrick Dangerfield was limited so much, and it's something that had been touched on a little bit in the media, was that Hayden Young went to him and tagged him pretty hard, and he ended up getting some good midfield possessions off of that. Willem Drew was a clear candidate to tag Dangerfield this week, and that's going to be a really decisive matchup, I think. I wonder if Mark O'Connor is going to tag anyone like he should have last week, or if Chris Scott's just going to be a dumb fuck again. I mean... You don't necessarily have to tag someone with court. It's not like there's an obvious tag candidate. There are a bunch of good ones, but there's no like, oh, you have to tag this guy in particular. Zach Butters is a clear candidate. Connor Rosie's been in good form again as of late. Or maybe you're just trying to get O'Connor to neutralize Willem Drew. Just like tag the tagger. The good news is that I see not just one pass for how the Cats can win this game. I think this is a pretty open one if the Cats can get some decent midfield possession. I think they can win still with an inferior midfield. It just requires, you know, Stewart and decoding can't give away three goals off turnovers because that was 12 huge points. And Jeremy Cameron missed out on 10 points by hitting the post. You know, you take those 22 points, that turns last week's game into a 15-point win. Now, a 15-point win over Frio wouldn't have been inspiring, but it proves that you can win even if your midfield is not that good when you're good enough in both 50s, which this team certainly can be. But I'd love to see Max Holmes really get the ball a bunch this week in the middle of the field. I'd love to see Brad Close utilizing his speed there. The The thing that makes me most confident is that it's a night game at home. The last three home losses have all been early games. When is the last time they lost a night game at, at home? Has it happened since we started watching in 2020? Yes, but not with people in attendance. Oh, was that a GWS when College Ashley scored his first goal? There was that. There was that Melbourne game. I want to say Carlton in round in, in 2020 was also a night game, but they haven't lost a home night game with people in attendance in like four years. Make of that what you will. Me and Pino, there's probably not a lot to it, but it's play something up with the mystique of Cardinia Park. And I don't know. It's something. My focus, though, will be on Sydney Derby 26 because fuck yes, this matters. I am so up for a big crowd at Giants Stadium. Watch it not be sold out. I mean, it holds, what, like 25,000? I don't think it even holds that. And it still won't sell out. Well, no, here's the thing. The first Sydney Derby this year drew 31,000 with shitty weather and not as much on the line. Last year's round one Sydney Derby drew 25,000. But that was Stadium Australia. And there was still the prospect of Buddy kicking a thousand. I think it's like this game has to sell. Come on, eighteen thousand. So this will be just five minutes after the Cats and Power get underway. Seven thirty p.m. locally, five thirty a.m. on the East Coast of the U.S. Two thirty a.m. on the West Coast. Unfortunate that this is a Fox Soccer Plus game where I would love for City Derby to be exposed to greater international audiences again. Another argument to have watch AFL. I still cannot believe that the Giants have won seven in a row when they only won six games all of last year, but here they are. They're in sixth after beating the Bulldogs in Ballarat. It was Toby Green doing great things in the second half once again, being the leader that we know he can be, and the Giants putting on another comeback. Their largest comeback in club history. You'd think they would have something in the 40s, but yeah, 35 is their biggest. So the Swans do have a 15 to 10 lead in the history of this series. First meeting this year was an instant classic. Another tight GWS win over the Swans. It seems like that's pretty much the only way they can beat them. Yeah, tight as in one point. Had the lead for most of the first half. Swans took over in the third quarter, had a 24 point lead in the fourth, but Toby led them all the way back, kicked the game winner with 42 seconds left. Just a phenomenal game. And he earned... Not just the Brett Kirk medal, but the most prestigious award of all. Main character for that round. As of now, the main character for last round looks like it's going to be Harrison Petty, based on how the polls are going, but uh, we'll update you on that. Good. We both backed in Petty for that, so that's good to hear. Um, On GWS's side, both Tom Green and Jesse Hogan are hopeful to return. Green coming back from his hamstring, Hogan from a quad injury. 
Ryan Angwin and Aaron Cadman would be obvious casualties there. Maybe you put Angwin as a sub. You could also put Nick Haynes as a sub again. He was the sub in round 21. If he does play, would be his 200th game. And he's an inaugural giant, was an early pick in 2011, made his debut in the first half of the 2012 season. He had a few options for Southern as well between Haynes, Angwin, Josh Fahey, who had a very important role to play as the sub for that win against the Crows in Adelaide. It's a young but increasingly deep list, and that's what has me so excited about this era for the Giants as a whole. I have a couple of questions for you that I've been meaning to ask for a while about GWS. Fire away. First off, should they change the logo? Because it doesn't really look like a G. I think it needs to look more G. Yeah, it it does look a bit like a C. I, I'm more steadfast on them needing to drop their original jumper, getting rid of the, you know, the kind of the orange top charcoal bottom thing and just going all in on all orange, the all charcoal never surrender look, which they'll be wearing again this week and a white clash. My second question, does calling themselves greater Western Sydney give people like less of a connection? I feel like if they were just Western Sydney or just New South Wales. Oh, that that they're not going to be called New South Wales. That's that's a touchy subject right there. They do not represent the whole of the state. I think just and make Western Sydney. Maybe they were trying to do a separate thing from the Wanderers, the A-League team. I don't know. At least if they became Western Sydney, you just change the word later in the song. But like mighty. I don't think there are any changes on the horizon. I just think, I mean, do they have an identity for people to connect with? Like what? What is going to make someone a fan of this team? As fun as they are, I'm just thinking, like, what sort of Sydney locals are going to, like, gravitate towards this team? I think it's got to come with on-field results then. And a derby sweep would go a long way toward that. Still, ev- even with that, it's like you're in a state where football takes the backseat. The Swans have a strong identity. I don't know how you're going to win people over that are already Swans fans. And I don't know how many people... Are going to look and say, yeah, now I want to be the fan of a team. Unless there are people that are like, I don't want to have a club that moved here. I want something that's ours. And even then, you know, the Swans have been there for long enough that that sentiment has probably gone away if it was ever there in the first place. Oh, it definitely was there. Speaking to older uh, city natives, it was like, I want this game to be such a good atmosphere. Like, I think of the Derby that the Giants won at the SCG in 2021. And like that great shot on the go ahead goal of the GWS cheer squad, just a couple sections off the goal because they're not directly behind the goal at the SCG. Absolutely nuts. Like that was great. We need more of that. And and we missed that last time in round seven because of the rain. No, this should be a great atmosphere. And I hope the fans do show up for it. It would be, especially if it's Giants fans showing up for it, that would be a real positive statement on the status of Australian rules football in New South Wales. Forecast does look fine. Looks like it's supposed to rain some Sunday, but Saturday should be good to go. Hell yeah. Could be a bit slippery on the ground that if it if the if it gets a bit humid. So can watch for that. The Swans enter at 9, 9, and 1 in 10th after beating Essendon in a game that should not have ended as tight as it was, but they controlled it well enough. But Half injuries are the story for the Swans. Dane Rampy out for one of the two weeks, Justin McInerney for three weeks, and Buddy Franklin for, oh wait, he also retired. I think we touched on this briefly in the recap the other day. Obviously, we only got to see the end of his career, about two and a half seasons worth, but it's disappointing that this is going to be how it ends. I know he's not a guy that seems to really like having much fanfare, which is so odd, as I've said, because... He always has a lot of it on the field, but for him to just say like, all right, thanks guys. Seems kind of odd. I I was thinking, and this is unrelated and this will appeal to like a very small subsection of listeners, but I was thinking about like legends of the game retiring. And I was thinking like, there's no way Zach Greinke could have a conventional retirement, right? I feel like he could pull a Bob Hamlin and just suddenly leave the dugout in the clubhouse during the game. I feel like he's gotten into something more than just, you know, you look at the MLB transactions page and it's just, oh, he turned in his retirement paperwork. He's got to do something really creative. So I'm just thinking of a giant art installation, you know, like made out of yarn or something, spelling out, I retire. 
had a lot of retirement talk as of late with some players, you know, giving the news a couple rounds in advance, allowing for that final proper send off. But perhaps that just isn't Buddy's thing. I hope he is around for the final home game at the SCG to get the the love that he that we know that he would get from Swans fans and from footy fans in general. And I hope he's there for the, you know, the the parade of retirees for the grand final as well. Was just going to say that. So with these three calf injuries and one retirement bundled with them, so clear changes are needed. And the first thing that I was thinking is, do you move Hayden McLean back to a forward spot? Because Tom Hickey was strong in the reserves. And against Kieran Briggs, I feel like he got to cut off his work at clearance because he's improved so much below the knees that you need somebody to really be able to body up to him. And Tom Hickey is the type that should be able to do that. I'm thinking about it less from matching up with Briggs and more about flooding the forward 50 so that Sam Taylor can't just take everything away. I think having a bunch of tall forwards in there could make it tougher for them to stop your entries. That's the other part of it. I was just thinking more about the Giants being so strong at winning the ball in the, in the first place off the ground. And with Tom Green potentially being back in as well, that, that being such a strength of Greater Western Sydney style. There are two clear areas where you're going to need to stop them. I mean, this is a team that a lot of people have come to be surprised about their depth, especially now that Sam Taylor is back healthy and playing as the All-Australian that we know he can be. I'm just thinking it's like, you know Taylor's going to take away one of your forwards, so make sure that you have a couple others. That Or do you do the type of thing that St. Kilda did to James Sicily last week and have a guy stay on him, bring extra numbers to him, just kind of get him off his lines a little bit, and then you have the other talls there benefit from that. You still can see Jack Bowler and Will Gold come in then. I feel like either way, solution is have a bunch of talls, whether that's McLean, Bowler, Gold, whatever the solution may be. If you're going to need a bunch of tall forwards in there. It's just a matter of how you deploy them. The concern defensively is what they're going to do without Rampy because in the past when they were without Rampy, they were able to bring in Lewis Melican, but he's still sidelined with his hamstring injury and Aaron Francis is definitely a step down. The Giants are three and a half point favorites. There's a lot of list uncertainty about this. I want the Giants to get the sweep for a lot of reasons, but I want to stay away from tipping this one until I see the lists. On the official tipping competition for now, I clicked on the Swans, but I I could see this go either way. I think the reason I'm going to go with the Swans is it seems like the road team has had a lot of success between these two. Especially the Swans at the show round tended to put up some pretty severe margins at times. I, I can't see the Giants winning a blowout. It's not how this rivalry goes, especially when the Giants win. I, I feel like this is one of those anything could happen games, which makes it really fun. A game that seems more predictable, at least on paper, is your Sunday opener where North Melbourne hosts Melbourne at Lundstone Arena. This will be 1.10 p.m. in Bell Riv, just outside of Hobart. 8.10 p.m. Saturday on the West Coast of the United States. 11.10 p.m. Saturday on the East Coast of the United States. And 6.10 a.m. if you're going to be watching from Greece after a long night of Santorini. Mykonosing or Thessaloniki, you could do better. It's a Fox Soccer Plus game. North Melbourne, the number 17 has been seen a lot because they're 2-17. and 17. They're in 17, so they've lost 17 in a row. I don't think the number 17 haunts them nearly as much as the number 76. The Demons are 13-6. and six. They're in fourth after beating the Tigers. The big story for this game, of course, is Alistair Clarkson's return. I believe, actually, Clarkson's last game, was it not the first meeting with the Demons? Or no, it was a couple of weeks after. That game was round seven. His final, uh, his most recent game was round nine, apparently. But round seven was maybe North Melbourne's worst performance of the year. It was an eight goal to one first quarter in the Demons' favor, and four different players for them kicked at least three goals, with Bailey Fritch leading the way with four as the Demons put on a 90-point victory at the G. Melbourne have won the last four meetings, and this is a matchup that often takes place on Tasmania. This will be the fifth of six North Melbourne home meetings since 2016 to be played at Bloodstone Arena, and that had never happened prior to then. So it's a recent development, but it's one that's really stuck as of late. 
I'm surprised that it's only four in a row. Not that like the 2020 Demons were a particularly good team, but I would have guessed that this one is a lot longer. North's last win over the D's came by five points in 2019 at, sure enough, Blundstone. Since then, though, none of the meetings have been close. I just wanted to say this about Melbourne. I was thinking about this in the context of how winning the flag last year led to Geelong having, you know, a shorter offseason and, you know, struggling with injuries and fitness stuff entering this year. And it makes the way the Demons started last season, winning, what was it, their first 10 games after winning a flag, like, that should not be possible. You're kind of starting behind the eight ball coming off of a flag, and they still started last season so well. So I just, I just wanted to take a moment while we're on the subject just to appreciate that because I think it's a very difficult thing to pull off. In addition to this game being Alistair Clarkson's return as head coach, it will be his 400th AFL game coach because he coached 390 of them with the Hawks from, from 2005 to 21. So a very impressive milestone there. Clarkson will become, I believe, the 13th coach to reach the 400 game milestone. Who is the all-time leader in games coach? Mick Balthouse, 718. I feel like we've had this discussion before. I'll try to, eventually I'll remember it. Yeah, Mick Balthouse just passed uh, Jock McHale, the legendary Collingwood coach for whom the head coach's premiership medal is named. With Clarkson's return, you can see some interesting things with selection in general. You'll see how much of what transpired during Brett Radden's time as caretaker sticks. We do know that Josh Goder, despite being subbed out with a knee injury this past week, is expected to play, so good news there. I'm particularly a fan of Goder and the way he started this season. He's a player that I want them to keep long-term and really have in things. He's one of their few defenders that I think as work with them could actually stick in terms of, you know, not as a ball mover, but as an actual defensive defender. Thank you. That's what that's the thing I've been saying all along. I'm glad that you see it as well. Yeah, I noticed it during that game against the Saints, especially since you had pointed him out to me. Watched him pretty closely that game and liked what I saw. Unfortunately, Callum Coleman Jones, Liam Shields, and George Wardlaw will will all likely be out again. Timeline's still unclear on CCJ after that second concussion. The good news there is it means you can continue rolling with both Todd Goldstein and Tristan Jerry, which I'd like. Worked last week to the two to fifty five hitouts. I've been calling for Hugh Greenwood to come back in ever since he's been dropped. I insist that if he were in last week, able to counter some of the Eagles' pressure, North would have won. Like, I know Greenwood's possession numbers when guys like Davies, Uniac, and Sid have been healthy haven't been great, but he's clearly shown he's a good midfielder. And mids can have value even if they don't put up those possessions. If they can facilitate other great ball movers like those two, there's value in that. Ben Cunnington is another name that I'm surprised we haven't seen in the AFL in a bit and that he's willing to stick it out in the reserves just shows how dedicated he is to the club and that's something to really be respected he was among the best for the Kangas and reserves last week along with Charlie Lazaro and Callan Dawson a lot of players are coming back from injuries from them but uh there's one who's not Aaron Hall was listed as being a potential return from an Achilles injury on the in the mix article In fact, he has retired, effective immediately. He had been managing an Achilles injury in recent months, hasn't been in the greatest of health in his time at North, sadly, after. I know he was, you know, somewhat of an interesting player, especially having some forward time on the Gold Coast, something that we didn't see. We more associated with him being just a very high ground game player out of the back. I think he has the record for me. Yeah, I think he got that last year. May have been in Tasmania. Yeah, long and round. I think it was it was over thirteen hundred. I don't think it was thirteen hundred. I think it was eleven sixty nine. Nice. Whatever it was, I could see him as a guy who gets the itch to come back at some point and unretires. I think of the guys that are retiring right now, I think he's the most likely to unretire. It was last year. It was eleven sixty nine. I was right. It was in round fifteen against the Crows. Uh, so th- I think that was at One Stone Arena then. What it had to be. On Melbourne's side, Tom Sparrow's likely back from his calf injury, so probably just jumps in for James Harms, who has played decently well, but has kicked straight. And, you know, Harms is another of those guys where it's like, if you went to another club, you'd be playing every week. 
Uh, Adam Tomlinson got subbed out last week, but could stay in because Harrison Petty probably stays up forward. I wouldn't mind if Joel Smith just got the whole game as a defender, but obviously they've done really well with utilizing him as a sub. He's also a lot more than just a defender. We've seen his forward capability as well the past couple of weeks. He helped turn that game back around against the Crows with the quick goal and the assist he got. So I think they found something really good there. With, and that's why I think they want to keep him as a sub because they can plug him in different spots. I mean, you could just stick him as defender for the whole game and have him at the full 22, but I can see why you also would consider, you know, even as well as he played, why you'd want to keep him in that spot. With the KC Demons on a bye this week in the VFL and, you know, North being their opponent, there is a decent chance that some players get managed as you look toward the finals run for them and a real case for them to snag second spot. Brody Grundy played mostly in the middle last week. Could use him to lighten the load on Max Dahl, especially with Todd Goldstein in there. Even though Todd's not you know, the superstar he may have been at one point. Or, I don't know if superstar, maybe that puts it a little too generously, but obviously we really like him. Anyway, you could you could take some of the wear and tear off of gone. Uh, Michael Hibbert had 35 disposals as a defender. Maybe if give someone like Trent Rivers a game off. Ben Brown maybe gets back in his home state. I just, I feel like one way or another, you probably manage a couple guys for this game. It seems inevitable, and I wouldn't mind gone being left out. It, it would be a very understandable move. You know, he was basically the entire team last week at times. Yeah, he put the team on his back. I put a team on my fucking back, though. Oh, shit. Noah Balta. One of the most hardest hitting defenders in the league. Would it be Noah Balta or I don't know who? I don't know because Petty trashed Balta. Who would even count for Richmond as one of the most hardest hitting defenders? Trying to think of who on that team is like a really impactful tackler, like a Braden Maynard type that just like when he hits you, it's like you're going to feel. You see, there's no one really that's like that. I mean, I don't want to say Ryan Mansell, but I mean, I, I feel like Dusty. I mean, when Dusty gets to you, you feel it. You know, oh, shit. shit. Dustin Marshall. I'm just going to say it because I really want to say this. Oh, shit. Hugo Ralph Smith. You guys have to know that clip, right? That should be like required viewing. If you don't understand, just look up Greg Jennings' team on my back. I think you will not be required viewing. Like, if I was running a Central Asian country, instead of writing my own book and making people read it, I would have, like, compulsory memes and references that everyone would need to know. And Dimitri James's video with Greg Jennings would have to be one of them. Oh, absolutely. That's kind of, yeah. Melbourne are 42 and a half point favorites. All right. That sounds good to me. You know, just a few weeks ago, I would have said this matchup being the mid-afternoon Sunday 7 broadcast. Like, really? And now it's spicy. It's really spicy. The Saints and Blues matchup tends to be spicy for one reason or another. It's a very common Marvel Stadium matchup, and one where the technical visiting team has had success as of late. The technical visitor is one of the last four meetings. I'm more keen on whether Voss can finally beat Ross, because Ross Lyon is 6-0 and against Michael Voss as a head coach. So this is the 7 broadcast, you know, the lead-in to the Sunday news, so the 3.20 p.m. bounce as normal. Here in the U.S., 1.20 a.m. Eastern, Sunday the 6th, 10.20 p.m. Pacific, Saturday the 5th. If you don't have watch AFL, this will be a delayed broadcast on Fox Soccer Plus, 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Sunday the 6th. These teams played back in round six, and it was really like, it, it kind of set the tone for those next few weeks for the Blues. They kicked 8-12, Harry McKay couldn't do anything, Saints won by 22 uh, Jack Sinclair had a really good game. That was when frustrations were just starting to bubble up for Blues fans. And then over the next few weeks, they boiled and boiled. And it was really fun. Okay, and now they've won six in a row. Meanwhile, the Saints were five and one at that time. I'm not saying lids were off then for them, but there was I think one of our Carlton thing. Uh, lids can be any once thing, I think. Yeah, I, I only associate lids with Carlton. Sorry. But that round was where we really started noticing Jack Sinclair being in that more active downfield role, having that wing time as opposed to being a steadier halfback like we've seen from him in the past. On the Saints side of things, 
Anthony Caminiti's suspension for striking James Sicily was downgraded to a fine, which I'm kind of surprised by because not the first time he's been popped for striking this year. The biggest argument there was relating it to the Charlie Ballard suspension that was reduced. I think that was uh, when he was struck. I think Kyle Langford. I don't know. I just think Caminiti needs to learn, like, stop hitting people. You know what he should do instead? He needs to make people do the uh, the stop hitting yourself old trick. I think that would be more fun. And then I don't think he'd get fined at all if he just, like, grabbed Jake Sicily's arm and made him slap himself. You know, stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. That seems like a Mitch Robinson move. Yes. Maybe he did that when he was coaching the Division 12 resis. I need to watch that video still. Um, we have Mitch Robinson. It's, like, it's kind of like a Lance Stevenson type thing, right? Uh, I think that's a step up from blowing in people's ears and untying their shoelaces on the free throw line. I think this would be right in there. Anyway, as for other Saints news, they could get some reinforcements up front. Tim Membry and Jack Hayes both played VFL. They were trying to get back from knee injuries. I like Membry a lot. I've also liked Jade Gresham, who was the sub in round 20. He came in when Zach Jones hurt his MCL, a season-ending injury. Zach Jones just has rotten injury luck. I think he's on the glass bones, paper skin, and cotton candy ligaments team. Looks like Nick Caulfield and Tom Highmore played well. And most impressive of all, Max Kane is a test for this week after that shoulder injury that was likely to end his season when he first suffered around 17. He's made a surprisingly impressive recovery. Yeah, I'm blown away by that. No ASMR there. The fact that the turnaround has been so swift and defying expectations there. Sakilda all of a sudden could have a wealth of tolls. And Ross Line was mentioning just a few weeks ago how the workload had gotten to guys like Caminiti and Matthias Filippo a bit. I'm not saying rest them now, but, you know, there's some flexibility that they can have there. And I would probably rest Filippo just because... He hasn't been as good as he was at the start of the year. I think it's hard to take out Cam and Nitty, though, at this point. But if Filippo has to be the one to make way and Cam and Nitty has to play a bit higher up in order for Memory or King to get in and for Hayes to support Rowan Marshall and the Ruck, they can live with that. More than live with it. Also, having a bunch of talls probably fits a slower game better, which would play into their hands. You Honestly, though, after last week and how they were able to take on the game, we can see how they can operate at different tempos, and we expect the Blues to be more willing to push the pace. The question is, are the Saints willing to play into the Blues' hand and say, no, we can do this too, or we don't want this, let's go back to Ross Ball. That's exactly what I'm wondering. The Blues will be without Adam Chera for at least two weeks with the hamstring injury he suffered against Collingwood, but they were just fine in that game for so many reasons. Patty Dow showed well in limited time. Can he please be in the 22 against an actual opponent? Because that hasn't happened yet. He deserves it. I mean, that said, he's another one of those, like, do you keep him as the sub because he's been good at it? If you want him to stick around, you've got to play him in the 22. And you know, he wouldn't have the central role. Patrick Cripps will probably need, need to do more of that running work, maybe have some of the pressure alleviated off the contest for him. Chara does need to be made up for in the aggregate, and Dow can help with that. In the reserves, Jack Carroll, Zach Fisher, and Jack were still waiting on Bins' debut. At this point, I'm expecting it to not happen this year because of how frequently it's been brought up. And Corey Durden can return at some level from a shoulder injury. That's likely the VFL. They've got a good forward mix right now. Love what they've done on the smaller side as of late with Jack Martin really becoming that next target after Charlie Curno and Jesse Motlop being the dynamic player we know he can be. The two of them have fed off each other really well for some key moments, including this past Friday. We are Jesse Motlop enjoyers, and you should be too. Blues favored by 15 and a half. I mean, I like the way they've been playing lately, but I don't know, does that seem a little high? Just like, I don't get the feeling this game is decided by like less than two goals. I don't know who wins it. I don't think this game comes out in the final siren. I feel like maybe whoever wins this game wins it by about two to three goals. I could see it like an eight-point margin. You know, not enough where one kick is going to change it, but still single digit. The Blues are the more likely team to win in a blowout, right? I would think so based on their recent form and how the Saints' efforts to slow things down can end up being futile in that case. We're going to be impressed with who wins this game regardless, I think, though. It's not going to be one where we're going to lament the errors of the losing team as much. It's not like I think neither team deserved four points, is what you're saying. 
I think the four points could be thoroughly deserved, and that could be the topic of the discussion rather than, wow, whichever club lost really blew this. This is a game that I think will be won definitively rather than lost, is the point. As opposed to how, you know, for example, North lost to West Coast last week. Final game of the round, Frio hosting Brisbane at Optus Stadium, a matchup that usually is pretty compelling. Lions rolled the Dockers in the early meeting this year, but Frio at the time, part of their very weird up and down season, they at least like started handballing and moving the ball aggressively through the corridor. And I think that led to some of their success in the following week. The issue was that nobody went to Lockie Neal. And I feel like that's way too obvious of a thing to fix, especially when Frio should know what Lockie Neal's style is like. And Brandon Starsevich had an excellent game. Michael Walters is a hard player to keep down for an entire outing, and he kept Sonny in check. The Lions have won four of the last five meetings, and this is the fifth meeting between Frio and Brisbane at Optus Stadium. You know where this conversation's going. Caleb Zorong's got to be the one to take Neal, right? Is it Zorong or is he going to be that contested bull himself trying to win the ball more than focus on walling out Neal. I love, by the way, what the Suns did on him this past week, where it was like Tuke Miller going to the bench at the same time as him and everything. Oh, well, Tuke very clearly said, I want this matchup. I can take him on. I am better than him. The whole whole thing was just so funny because it was like, it was like, do everything he does. Like, you are going to copy every last thing he does. I think Caleb Sarong is capable of that, despite having a bit of a smaller frame. So I'd love it if Justin Longmere does that. I can see Andrew Brashaw getting in to put another body on him a bit more. It's very tough to manage that between Neil and Dunkley. Could be a case of really having those two matchups be set for the entire game. And then maybe Dane Zorkel will just claim that somebody grabbed his nuts again. I mean, he did get them grabbed. It was a matter if it was intentional. A couple big injury concerns for the Lions. Kadeem Coleman suffered an eye injury late in Q-Clash when he took a Sharon to the face. And and he's been a very difficult player to replace over the past couple years. Does Daniel Rich return for the first time since round 13 after getting through his training block? Does Jackson Pryor come up for the reserves? Regardless, it's going to be a very different shade out of halfback for the Lions. And it's not easy even in the aggregate, to make up for Coleman's absence. Also, Oscar McInerney ended Q Clash with his ankle strapped up and iced on the bench. So does Darcy Ford have to come in there? He would be the obvious replacement if Big O can't go. I feel like not facing Darcy, it would be easier to stomach that. At the same time, you could just see Luke Jackson do everything. Yeah. Losses will have to be cut somewhere. Do you have Danaher go to Jackson? Because, I mean, Joe's shown the ability to play elsewhere on the ground. And he was quieter this past week. I I want Joe to get back in good goal-kicking form as a thing. I think it would be that secondary ruck, but not primary. Zach Bailey is expecting back. He hurt his ankle in round 18. Did you see the video of him a few weeks ago trying to bounce the ball? It's not as easy as it looks. And then from Michael Whiting, Jack Dunstan did not do much last week. I barely noticed him. And when he's been managed before, it's usually had the desired results. So maybe they do that again. Would also force more targeting of Danaher. And I wouldn't mind that. I don't I don't count on Frio's defense having a collective good game set for another week. I just I just don't, even if Red and Cox is pushing to return. Joel Hamling's been more serviceable than I expected, and at times has actually been a pretty decent replacement. I could see Alex Pierce putting up another good game, though that I could see happening. As a collective, though, even as autonomous as they be, I'm not sure, especially with the onslaught that the Lions can bring. I think Jordan Clark is someone that they could really target and punish with a strong one-on-one. I could see somebody like Cam Raider having fun with that. Well, Clark usually roams and isn't tied into one guy. You know, it's his speed and mobility that makes him a useful player. But someone like Raider could go on to him, is my point, and try to limit his mobility. Raider's got the motor to do that, and we haven't really seen anybody try to take on Clark like that. I want Chris Fagan to shake that up because it's really the one thing in Frio's defense, other than Luke Ryan, who is making an all-Australian case again, that 
that hasn't really been challenged this year. Clark always gets the ball. It's just a question of whether he delivers it. What happens if you prevent him from getting the ball in the first place? Some smaller options for the Dockers are facing tests. Those including one of my favorite players for them, Bailey Banfield, who last rated his knee a couple weeks ago. Will Brody and Carl Warner are also among that group. I got to think that Matt and that Matty Johnson comes back in after having been managed last week. Just another player to throw there in the midfield. Decent with pressure. One of their better deliveries forward as well. People have been comparing him to David Mundy at times. And with the precise kick that he has, I am not opposed to the comparison. The question, of course, is, you know, the longevity. But I'm liking the early signs from him. The Lions are 13 and a half point favorites. This is a matchup that can at times be dependent on where it's played. I don't think that's going to be enough of an effect here, though. I would really like to see the Dockers play well, make me feel better about what happened last week. I I don't know. I would be very surprised if they win. I would be, I think there's a decent shot they go out there and put up a good fight. All right, Ethan, who is your main character pick for round 21? I have given like no thought to this whatsoever. Let's see. Let's go. Let's go Sam Taylor. Why not? He's had a really good season. He has, and even with limited time, you can see him up there for selection for a jacket at the end of the year. He is the best one-on-one defender in the competition. So who who is he on, actually, is a good question here. With Joel Amarty having kicked four goals last week, is Amarty the choice there? As maybe the most threatening of the talls? I think that's not out of the question. Cindy Derby will be full of storylines, but I'm really looking toward that St. Kilda Carlton game on Sunday as it being a real talking point. And I think Patrick Cripps is the guy that could take Carlton over the edge, especially with Adam Chera out. He's going to garner more attention, and I think he can play up to it and through it. So he's your main character pick, I take it? Yeah, Patrick Cripps. All right, some bigger names this week, but for good reasons. And a lot of the, I mean, a decent amount of time, it has ended up being a bigger name. That's going to do it for this show. This was episode 124 of Americans Watching the Footy, our round 21 preview. As I've said before, I can't believe how fast this season's grown up. I remember when Gil was breastfeeding it not that long ago. We've gone over this bit before. We don't need to do it again. Does Footy walk the bitty? Are the West Coast Eagles the record? Or is it 1996 Fitzroy? Find me on Twitter at Castle Media. Find Brian on Instagram at Kathy Graham. Find me at BenjaminHK01 on Twitter. Find us collectively on Twitter and YouTube at Americans Footy. We'll need to be more active in YouTube with creating things other than just posting our episodes there. A lot of ideas going ahead, but I'm excited for how this last stretch of the season is going to come about. Still, so many possibilities, and I'm ready to dive in on Friday. I do have an idea. I think it will be funnier if we keep the YouTube format the way it is, where it's just, you know, instead of like any sort of visual of us talking, it's just the episode. You know, there's like a, it's like a super thumbnail, but we do things that like can only be picked up on visually. I think that would be really funny. I was, I was inspired by having, you know, a super spicy lunch. Today. Like, how about an episode where, you know, I spend the whole time eating something really spicy, but we don't address it at all and nobody can even see it. Kind of like how Eric Andre had the cold episode, except he told everyone it was the cold episode, and he had um, a fridge keeper, right? Yes, a fridge keeper. Yeah, there will be no fridge keeper, but we should we should just have shit like that going on without explaining it to anybody. So tune in next time, and maybe we'll do something silly while we do it. We'll have an episode. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Only one way to find out. Come to our house and watch us record it live. <laughs>